Okay, so Mother Fruxia, I have here a list of things that people think about nuns. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> uh, this is kind of going to be like a rapid fire question segment. We've never done this at Tea Town okay. Seminary. A lot of firsts for this show. First nun, first coffee, first time we never actually had tea. <laughs> and now first rapid fire questioning <laughs> section. Um, of course, you don't have to just say yes. So basically what's going to be is I'm going to say an idea that people think mm -hmm. about nuns, and then you can say true or false, and maybe give a short explanation of why it's okay. true or false. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, uh, the first question, or the first idea that people have mm -hmm. about nuns. Women only become nuns because they can't get married. False. False. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So why do women become nuns? <laughs> uh, because... Because they feel drawn to a life that is dedicated to God and that um, facilitates self-transformation and um, close, greater closeness to God. And um, you know what? Uh, one of the sisters was telling me the other day about how really over the t over time, or in you know over the centuries, convents have really often been havens for women who were often were exceptionally talented or, or were really wanted to serve the church in a very dedicated way, and it made it possible for them to do that more fully than if they had been married. So, you know, it, I think it's a, it can be a little bit of a silly idea, <laughs> but um, it really it has pretty much no bearing on why you would become a monastic. I mean, like, that's, that's not a good reason. It's not even really a reason to become a monastic. <clears throat> All right, here's another one. Nuns are mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> did you do your homework? <laughs> I, I forgot to bring, <laughs> I forgot to bring my ruler. <laughs> I wanted to bring a ruler. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> I think it does depend. I mean, obviously, people. There are some people who have, especially in Catholic contexts, had bad experiences. We've encountered several people who had bad in experiences in Catholic schools when they were kids. So you know, I couldn't just say, "Well, all nuns aren't mean. They're very nice and all that." We were supposed to be trying to cultivate virtue and trying to cultivate a Christian way of of behaving. So being mean certainly doesn't fit into the into that. But, you know, what sometimes people think is mean is another thing because there are sometimes when monastics can be very blunt and direct about things and people don't like it and it seems like it's mean even if it isn't. So, I don't know. That's, oh, yeah. I think another reason why people think this, uh, a lot of times if someone's asking a question to a nun like, oh, excuse me, do you know where this room is or this, uh, this utensil I need for something? <laughs> The nun will not look at, look them in the eye. They'll look down and say, like, over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so actually, why is it the nuns and, and, and monks too? Why, do, why does that sometimes happen? Um. Well, I think that we are usually supposed to try to behave in a way that is not, how do I say? We are trying to cultivate a, a behavior that is modest, and I don't just mean like modest in the way that people think about like dressing or whatever. There is a way of behaving that is modest, that is not too, too um, forward or too uh, self-asserting, because that's completely antithetical to the way monastics are supposed to be. And there are certain outward behaviors that can help us to internalize that. And, and that's not because they're okay on their, on their own, as if just acting a certain way is enough. They're there for a reason. Um, we are supposed to try not to be too forward, too, too oh, I say too open. I mean, it's, there's a certain openness that's allowed depending on the person. Um, but if you encounter a monastic who is not engaging very much, then it may be that they also don't have a blessing to talk to you. Uh, not every monastic necessarily has a blessing. I mean, for instance, I'm only here because I'm doing it under obedience, um, and that's not because I, I, you know, I'm being forced to do it. It just means that I wouldn't be here if my superiors hadn't told me to do it. 
And there are plenty of monastics who are not necessarily given a blessing to speak to people outside the monastery or convent. Um, and there are those who are, you know, ha trying to maintain a monastic um, disposition. And sometimes the behaviors might offend those in the world, but it doesn't really matter what the, that they think because it's more important that the person be obedient and that the person try to, um, if they don't have a blessing to speak, to try to, to balance being not rude <laughs> with maintaining obedience. So, and I, I mean, a lot of times, we, I mean, we have been taught that it's better to put your head down, you know, that it's better not to assert yourself, not to, to put yourself forward. It can be a, an exercise or an effort to keep from engaging too directly with, with people who are in the world. And that can be necessary for an individual's spiritual life. Um, it may be what they were told specifically to do. It may be what they feel they need to do to try to maintain a certain separation from the world. Even if, if they have nothing against the person they're talking to, but that person is can be a source of temptation, even if they have no bad intention. And it is, it can be the safer way to try to maintain a certain distance. And that's how some people do it. And also like to physically express a humble way of being. To not be too direct, but to be always trying to direct your, your thoughts down. And to do that with your, with your eyes or with your head helps you to remember not to put yourself forward, not to, to act like you know things, not to behave in an arrogant way. And so it's more important in, in, in a monastic context to try to do that in a sincere way than it is to come across in a way that somebody in the world would approve of, you know? It, it, it's... it's there can, be a, there can be several things at work. Nuns are ultra serious and never smile. Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be. <laughs> now I have to try to get a straight face. Okay. <laughs> That's not going to work. Okay, I think I just, I think I already blasted that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's actually, yeah, I guess asking that question considering <laughs> how the conversation has gone. <laughs> Is a bit silly, but <laughs> <laughs> well, but, no, um, I, I know why people have that, that yeah. impression, and, and no, it's not true. But there, that's not because that's not because there isn't a certain amount of seriousness or solemnity about monastics. There should be. It's not, you know, but it. It's everything is supposed to be within measure. Uh, not neither neither uh, laughter to excess nor. Um, seriousness to the point of not be, of taking yourself too seriously. I think in some ways people are surprised to find humor in monastics, well either because they don't realize that we're normal human beings or because they don't realize that in some ways learning not to take yourself too seriously, it allows you to be a little bit more Lighthearted in a way. You don't have to be defending your ego all the time. You can actually see the sometimes humorous flaws in yourself, and that can even be helpful. So it's, yeah, I, I mean, there's no need for it to be seriousness all the time, but of course there needs to be a certain amount of solemnity, a certain amount of seriousness, and, and even levity has to be within bounds and should not, you know, exceed a certain amount. There's a balance. There's a balance, yeah. definitely a balance. You're not just happy-go-lucky. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, in some ways too, it, having some humor can help you to to deal with some of the harder things, the st harder struggles, and it's a, a balance is a really good idea. <laughs> it's sort of a healthy way of approaching things, I think. True or false? Being a nun is harder than being a layman. In some ways, true. In some ways, false. That would be my impression, because, because 
Because if you really didn't want to do the struggling part, then monasticism would be really hard and unpleasant for you. If you do want to do it and you are able to then benefit from it, then you realize that you're really glad that you did it and you begin to wonder why people stay in the world. So, but to say easier or not easy, I mean, it depends on what you mean by that, whether you think it's going to be, you know, what if you want things not to be hard, I mean, life in the world can be pretty hard depending on your situation, but, and I don't consider our life to be harder, but if somebody really didn't want to give up their own will, they'd, hard, they'd find it pretty hard. So, you know, it depends on your perspective of what you mean by hard and what you, what you want out of life, I guess. I mean, like, there are people who, who definitely believe, well, if, you know, um, if, I, if I commit a sin of any kind, whether it be like gluttony or something like that, it's not as bad that when I do it, because I'm, I'm at a lower standard than the monastic is. Mm -hmm. This is a very common belief, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if there's two people in a room, and you know, there's a, there's a, there's a nun and there's a lay, a lay woman there, and both of them commit the same sin, uh, they're going to say, well, the nun is going to get more in trouble than I will. <laughs> you know? uh, so what, what would you say about that? <laughs> well, thinking about spiritual life as in what you're going to get in trouble for is already not entirely helpful, I think, because even though we need spiritual, spiritual guides and superiors to help us, and to correct us, at the same time, essentially, it has to be something that we are doing ourselves. And if you're a layperson, yes, you, you have more freedom to do what you want. And if what you want is what matters to you, then being a layperson is probably a better idea. But in monasticism, too, it doesn't really work to think in terms of doing something or not doing something because you'll get in trouble. That, ha that can't be your motivation. And, and even if you have somebody who's there to correct you, it won't really do you any good unless you are trying to correct yourself. We have to remind ourselves that we are responsible for the example that we set and we are given, because we're given more spiritually there's more required of us. But if you're going to talk about, you know, having to answer for sins at the judgment, it's kind of, I mean, hopefully throughout your spiritual life, you are, every time you fall, you're getting up. Hopefully you're repenting. And you'll probably still have some sins that you're going to have to deal with, but I, I guess it's kind of a, an odd way to look at it from my perspective, because, because hopefully you're living your life such that you will, you will have been getting up every time. So even if you did sin, even if you, you screwed up a bunch of times, hopefully you also got up, you confessed, you got up, you kept struggling. And God honors that too. And it's not a legalistic kind of thing. It's more like, who do you make yourself into that you are stuck with in the next life? Because that's more like it. It's not really so much uh, like a legalistic, uh, a list of things that God is going to accuse you of, so much as how attached were you to your passions? How open were you to union with God? How much did you choose the passions over God? And... When you look at it that way, you know, it's not so much about whether the one, the bo both people fell to something. The attitude is going to matter a lot more because if they both fell to it, but one of them was constantly striving to get up, really wanting to be united with God, humbled by the fact that they, that they fell. And the other one is just like, well, it wasn't that bad and I wasn't held to that great a standard anyway. It's going to make an enormous difference, and not because of that particular sin anyway, right? It's going to have more to do with the spiritual state that somebody's in. Because if somebody's thinking in terms of, well, you know, I shouldn't have to do this, and, and God shouldn't require that of me, there doesn't even seem to be a place in that for, 
how ready am I to be united with God? Have I removed as much of the impediments between me and union with God as possible? Like that's not even in the ment that mentality. There's that whole just a legalistic, what am I going to have to answer for? God is going to be mad at me. It's not even really an orthodox way of looking at it. It's more of a Western way of looking at it. So for us, we would, we would think more in terms of what kind of a person are you at the end and how able are you to receive God? I, I was asking the sisters about some of the common misconceptions that they've encountered and one that at least two different people in different circumstances encountered was, and in both cases these are people who became nuns very early in life, um, the question that was addressed to them was, what happened to you in your young life that you wanted, that makes you want to throw your life away? So they assume that something bad happened in order to make us want to become monastics. And it's, it's such, it's sort of odd from the monastic perspective because it's like, well, what does that have to do with anything? But I understand what they mean. They don't, they, to monasticism is such a foreign idea. You think something drastic must have happened to you to make you want to run away from the world. But it's not like that at all. And while there may be some people who have not had very good experiences in the world, that's not necessarily going to have anything to do with the reason why they become monastics. Um, but it is a common conception, I think. And I wouldn't be surprised if it is even more common in regard to women becoming monastics, although I don't know that. Because there's this sort of assumption that if you're a woman, then you must obviously want to have kids and a family, and if you don't, something dreadful must have happened to you. It's not about this life. I mean, this life is pretty short, and it's not going to, we're not, we're not going to be able to escape dying. We're going to have to face eternity at some point. And for some people, for some of us, that's more important than any of this. That God is more important, that being able to be to be changed into something closer to what a Christian should be is more important. And not because there's anything wrong with family life, but there are a lot of distractions that come with family life that can be, you could say, avoided in monasticism, not because there isn't responsibility, not because there isn't a lot of stuff to do, but everything can then be focused on God. And and you can then live in a constantly sort of eternal context. So, you know, it's, it sort of comes down to what really matters to you. And this assumption that women should obviously want to be mothers is kind of, I mean, there's, it's not strange that women should become mothers, but at the same time, it also shouldn't be strange that any human being, man or woman, should be drawn to something that is beyond this world and to want to live for that. And it shouldn't require some disaster for that to happen. Maybe that will, you know, something may happen in somebody's life that wakes them up and makes them realize, oh, wait a second, it's the eternal that really matters. But there's no reason to assume that something drastic had to happen in order for someone in, early in their life to want to leave the world and serve God. Women or men or anybody really, they have a lot of ideas of what is a, a strong woman. Um, but what do you think is a, is a strong woman? I think in a way, uh, monasticism facilitates understanding better what true strength really is. because it requires you being able to face yourself. And it, it, it calls you to learning self-control. And I don't mean just by that in, a, in an outward sense, but in an inward sense as well, to learn how to control your 
not only your passionate impulses, but also your thoughts, your feelings, your behavior, your disposition. And since it helps you to look at yourself in a more honest and in-depth way, it makes you realize how much strength is required for something like meekness, which sounds to the world, I think, um, like something kind of meek and, I mean, like something kind of weak and nam namby-pamby, or, you know, like somebody says, you know, uh, she was a meek little woman. They usually mean somebody they're expecting to be like shrinking into the corner and not being able to stand up for herself and all that. That's not meekness. And true meekness requires a lot of strength, actually, because it requires it's not the matter of having no, for instance, no temper, um, but a matter of being able to choose not to become angry, to be able to choose to accept things that might be painful and not and not react to them in a fa in a passionate way. There is a lot about the spiritual life that requires an inner strength and which also builds it up. So when I think of what real strength is, I think in terms of self-control, of endurance, and not just like, you know, gritting your teeth and complaining about it, but actually choosing not to complain. How many times does it happen that, that um, people will, will, will complain about what's going on or will um, have to have the last word or have to, to say what they think or whatever in, a, in, an, in an unpleasant situation, whereas that's actually a choice. It doesn't have to happen, and it even can get to the point where you don't do it in your mind. But that takes a lot of work. And it takes wanting that. And so for me, humility, which is another one of those things which I think that secular society looks down on, or they like it in certain circumstances. Like if you have a war hero who's self-effacing, then humility is OK. Like humility, oh, well, that's so nice, you know. But humility in a, the general sense is not understood or appreciated, I think. And it requires a lot of strength. Because, I mean, on, on the one hand, it's something that is essentially comes from, from God. It's not something that we can produce independently. But it's something that we strive for. And in order to strive for it, I mean, how many times do people think theoretically that they want to be humble, but as soon as the opportunity comes along to be humbled, the opinion changes. You know, it's like, well, actually, I didn't mean it. <laughs> I don't really want to be humbled. I don't want to, you know, because taking being humbled in a, in a humble way is very hard, at least to begin with. Because every human being has, has pride, and the ego is very strong. And so being able to choose not to be angry, not to, def to defend your ego, not to, be, um, to justify yourself, all of that takes a lot of strength and a kind of strength that I'm not sure a lot of people in the world even really are familiar with because because the world doesn't require that of you. I mean, everybody is sort of taught you should you have a right to think what you want and to do what you want and to be whatever you want, and you know everybody is expressing themselves all over the place. You know and and can can say whatever you know comes to mind, and they have a right to their opinion and all of that. To choose not to do or be that takes a lot of strength. And I mean, if you think about the fact that, like I said before, you know, the monastics these days came out of the world that is like that, 
they have to consciously choose not to be that anymore. And that's a process. It's not really something that you can sort of instantaneously achieve. It means every time the opportunity comes to take correction, to take being put down, to take you know what is difficult and to accept it and to thank God for it and to be, to become more because of it. I think all of that is at least a component of what makes a strong person in a real way. And I don't think anybody in the world really wants to hear about um, humility <laughs> or meekness as the means of being a strong woman because, you know, they want, you know, want to be heard, want to be understood, want to have their say or whatever. But in a Christian context, everything is sort of flipped on its head. And, but if Christ is everything to you, which is how it should be, then what the world thinks, what the world indicates, doesn't mean anything. And so then when we're striving for humility and meekness, among other things, patience, we are striving for something that is Christ-like and something that makes us closer to Christ. And that makes, that's much more important. But it is a martyrdom because it's a martyrdom of the ego, of what you want, of how you want, how you want to be seen, of what you want to do, of you know, how you would like to believe you are, or you know, any number of things. All of that has to go. And that is by no means easy. Okay, so Mother Euphroxia, <laughs> um, there is an idea out there that monastics think they are better than lay people. Um, how would you address that idea? Any monastic who would think that has already kind of missing the point of what monasticism is for. It, it's kind of one of those paradoxical things about the spiritual life that the the more you struggle and the more you progress, the better you realize what what a mess you are. And so we're striving we're striving to to overcome our passions, which is only possible with the help of God, of course. But part of the spiritual life is coming to an honest understanding of our fallenness. And as I mentioned before, monasticism and monasteries are spiritual hospitals, places for um, treatment and healing. And one of the most important aspects of receiving treatment and healing is realizing that you need it. So it's usually those who realize that they're spiritually ill and that they need spiritual treatment who are going to the hospital. And, but the interesting thing is that those who have received help from the treatment, those who have um, gained the, the benefit or some of the benefit that monasticism can bring if, if, if applied in the right way, will have come to a better understanding of just how not worthy they are, just how worthless they are without the help of God. And everything becomes dependent on the help of God and no trust in yourself. And the thing is, you know, when we're striving for humility, it doesn't really work to either start out or to somehow end up at a state in which you think, because I'm striving for humility, I'm better, better than other people. It's like, boy, you've just completely turned it inside out and, and you obviously didn't learn anything. So it's, it's kind of uh, an interesting aspect of humility and the spiritual life in general, though, that those who did actually make progress those who are, and I'm thinking like in terms of holy elders that we know about, 
those who have obviously made spiritual progress and who are in a better spiritual state than most people are the ones who would never ever think so about themselves because they are better aware than anyone of their fallenness. Because it's kind of like, you know, how um, St. Dorotheos tells that story about the and person who was trying to understand humility and how it was that somebody who was humble <clears throat> and more, obviously more spiritually advanced could somehow think they were worse than everyone. And he used the example of, and of course it's a little harder in, American const in, in, in an American context, but we can still kind of put ourselves there to understand. He, he, talk, he was talking to a, a man who was like um, kind of one of the foremost citizens of a little town. And he said, when you're in your town, how, do you how would you perceive yourself, you know, in the social status way? And he said, oh, I would think of myself as one of the foremost citizens. So then he says, and if you went to such and such a city, so he, he sort of goes through increasingly important places. And as he's going to the more important places, the person's self-estimation is going down. And by the time he gets to, and what if you were before the emperor? So he's talking about like the, at that point, the Byzantine emperor. Then how would you consider yourself? And he says, oh, I would consider myself the lowliest of peasants. And he says, exactly. So those who have come closer to the king understand better their own lowliness. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting aspect of it that, well, no monastic who's actually trying to learn what monasticism is there to teach them has any business to think they're better than anybody else. Those who may have actually become better spiritually are the last ones who are ever going to think so. What's a, a good way loved ones can deal with the fact that a family member became a monastic um, because you know of course if you if you're uh, you know your sibling or a good friend of yours becomes a monastic you're obviously your relationship with them is going to be totally different now and you probably won't see them as often mm -hmm. uh, so what is a way for someone like that to deal um, with that reality well it requires a bit of sacrifice uh, I think it's it's a sacrifice that a lot of family members aren't very happy about having to make. But I think that it calls you to a higher and more, more truly Christian kind of love because you're being called to be able to accept and sacrifice what you want or how you feel for what your loved one has decided to do for the sake of God. So in a way, you are being called to, to consciously sacrifice something earthly for the sake of the heavenly. And what come, one thing that comes to mind, there's a, there's a story in the Desert Fathers, I'm trying to remember which saint, it might be Saint Paisios, I can't remember Saint Peven, I can't remember who, who had gone off to become a monk in the desert, and his mother came one day to the, to the monastery gates and was knocking and asked, you know, wanted to see him. And he said from within the monastery, uh, would you rather see me now or would you rather see me in eternity? And she said, well, if I'll see you in eternity, then that's enough for me. And I'd rather that than see you now and not see you in eternity. And so she left. And that is, that is a really admirable way for uh, a relative to be able to to choose the eternal context as well and to also honor the choice of the person who who became a monastic and i should say too that it's not a matter of a hatred for family or a dislike or no we shouldn't associate with people because of some a personal thing it is it is a necessary kind of separation because of all the temptations that come with any attachments to the world, not just family, but family has a very strong, has, can have a strong pull on people. And, and of course, we are also not just struggling our own, again, our, against our own passions, but 
there are also demons involved, and they like to use our weaknesses against us. And so, even though it can be difficult for family members and friends to understand at times why the separation has to happen, and it can be painful, at the same time, it should be understood that it is not meant to be in any way an offense or a disregard for them personally, but that it is something that is necessary for for the monastic to be able to separate from the world because any attachments to the world can draw them back to other things, to, to memories, to to old habits, to any number of things that could be um, ways that the demons can kind of get somebody to, to go back out into the world. And so it's just, it's a necessity, but I find it very admirable when family members are able to accept it, to honor the choice, and to then freely sacrifice their own, the comfort that they would have gotten from the person for something better. And and also, there's this story I, I always like, and also in the Desert Fathers somewhere, that I think is, is good for, because there, there can be a real temptation for, for monastics sometimes to feel like they're responsible for having abandoned their families or they're not helping support them or whatever. There can be all kinds of circumstances in which that can be a very strong pull. And there's this story about a monk who, who was beset by this temptation. I think he had left a mother and a sister in the world and he had been the one who had been supporting them. So this was a really good way of kind of drawing him back into the world. He was feeling guilty, you know, like, um, and, and finally the temptation got the better of him and he decided to go back out into the world because he was supposed to take care of his family. So he's on the road from the desert back to the city and he passes an angel. And he asks him where he's going or, you know, I don't remember the exact question, something like that. And the angel says, well, I was the angel that was sent by God to take care of your family. But now that you've decided to do it, I, I, I won't be doing that anymore. And the monk said, wait, no, 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 no never mind. <laughs> you do it. <laughs> I'll go back to my monastery. You know, and, and I think that that, that story is very helpful um, because because from, from a secular standpoint especially, or just from, from a, a non-monastic standpoint, um, the family responsibility can be a really big, big part of the picture. Or it can, you know, you can see, well, don't they have a responsibility? But the thing to understand or remember is that when somebody dedicates themselves to God, God doesn't abandon the people. And the person is actually giving everything that they have into the hands of God. And from that story, you can see they also have given their, their family members into the hands of God, and God takes care of them. So anyway, I, I hope that that's sort of helpful in understanding how to, to profitably deal with the difficulty of the separation that comes if somebody that you know well, or, or close to, enters monasticism. Mother Praxia, <laughs> thank you so much for coming onto the show. That was very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I had a very good time, and I'm very happy that you let me try some of this San Ignacio coffee. I hope our audience can try it <laughs> sometime, too. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for watching Tea Time at the Seminary. If you liked what you saw today, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel called St. Photios Orthodox Theological Seminary. Cheers.